Well, greetings, you curious hurly burlyites. We have what I think, and you'll know why in a minute, is a fascinating panel discussion on tap for you today. It's inspired by my friend Dale Eisler's book, From Left to Right, Saskatchewan's Political and Economic Transformation. How did a province like Saskatchewan, really the cradle of socialism in Canada, the birthplace of the CCF NDP, become the most reliably right-wing province in the country, all in one generation? You hurly burlyites know that I'm prelate born and Regina raised. I'm really excited that Dale is joining me today here, author, former journalist, senior federal public servant, and currently senior policy fellow at the Johnson Shoyama Graduate School of Public Policy in Regina. Joining Dale and I for the discussion, two other sons of Saskatchewan, Corey Tanaik and Dwayne Lingenfelter. You all know Corey, Mr. Good Hair, Conservative Party electoral <laughs> success guru, curse of politics panelist, and Dwayne, another towering Saskatchewan public figure. He's the former leader of the provincial NDP, president of the party, and in the governments of Blakeney and Romano, minister of a number of different key portfolios, as well as deputy premier. All right, guys, green is the color, politics is the game. Let's get at this, uh, everyone. I, I tell you, the one thing that we are not going to talk about today uh, with four people from Saskatchewan is the goddamn Rough Riders. No way. No way. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. Who are they? What a year. <laughs> yeah. What a year. Uh, anyway, let's let's get let's get into it. Let's get into it, guys. First of all, where is everybody? Corey, you're in where? I'm in Ottawa today. You're in Ottawa today. Dale, you're in Regina? I'm in Regina, yep. Yeah. And Dwayne? I'm sitting up looking out at a beautiful snowstorm in my at my farm at Cypress View in southwest Saskatchewan near the Cypress Hills. The Cypress Hills, if I'm not incorrect are the highest point of elevation in Canada, east of the Rocky Mountains. You'd, you'd never believe it. Our cottage in the Cypress Hills is the same elevation as Banff, Alberta. Exactly. Yeah. Growing up in Prelate, Cypress is a vacation. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's close by. Yeah. And David, where are you? Are you in Prelate? Yeah, no, <laughs> I'm not in Prelate because I have Wi-Fi. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I'm Sass in Toronto. Sass expanded to there, yeah. yeah. Imagine. You can probably get okay Sass tell service there. Maybe, uh, maybe. David, down, to this, down to 100 people or less now, Prelate. Um, do they still have the all-girls school there? No, it's uh, closed. And uh, we toured it about 10 years ago. Well, actually, when I was leader, I stopped in because um, I was curious. My sister had gone to school there. And uh, it was uh, still um, everything in place, the furniture, everything, but it hadn't been used for about five years. Well, remember, remember, so this is Prelate Saskatchewan was the uh, home of the Mother Superior of the Ursuline Nuns of Saskatchewan and had a girls' academy, which ultimately turned into a, it was originally a place where they recruited nuns and then turned into a place where they sent, where people sent their bad girls yeah. uh, to get whipped into shape. And uh, anyway, when it closed, when it closed, they sold, prelates a 100% German Catholic community, and they turned this convent girls' school into an Islamic school for boys. Oh. That, did uh, not take, the that did not take, I don't know why, but that did not take uh, out in prelate. Yeah. I, I didn't. I did not know that. And uh, another curious story, the nuns from prelate, uh, taught me at the separate school in Shaunavon for eight years, so I might be a little warped because of that, too. <laughs> well, I just hope it wasn't my sister. All right. So. <laughs> okay, so let's get to the item at hand. The short form of the story is this. Saskatchewan, as I said in the intro, is known as the cradle of socialism Canada. It's the home of the NDP. It's the home of Medicare. The home of the family of Crown Corporations, for those who remember that. Now the most reliably conservative voting province in Canada. In rural Saskatchewan, the conservative majorities look like those in totalitarian regimes. The NDP now seem like the Washington Generals, that team that the Harlem Globetrotters carried around to beat every night just to prove that there could be a contest. Saskatchewan Party has been the government for 15 years and currently lead the NDP by 20 points in the polls. So this is no longer a competitive political jurisdiction. 
Dale's written a book on this subject, and it's a good one, entitled From Left to Right. When I first saw the title, I thought it was a book about his golf game, but it's not. It's about Saskatchewan <laughs> politics. Dale, why don't you take a few minutes and just walk us through the central thesis of your book? Yeah, okay. Well, thanks, uh, David. So, f- uh, first of all, I mean, I guess I should say, why did I write this book? And uh, just to give it some context. So, um, you know, I was in Saskatchewan. I grew up in Saskatchewan, worked there for many, many years, was a journalist. And I left uh, in the mid, mid-90s and was gone for about 16 years or more. And while I was gone was really when this, this, econo- this political and economic transformation occurred. And uh, I sort of felt it was one of the more interesting stories in Canadian politics and one of the least reported or underreported stories. And uh, I just wanted to figure out what the hell happened to Saskatchewan because I missed most of it uh, while I was away. So I decided to do this. And, um, and David, you talked about Saskatchewan being the cradle of socialism, which, which is very true. But I also believe, uh, I've long believed, it's a bit of a caricature too. I think it's, um, it's a bit of a misunderstanding of Saskatchewan to, to consider it sort of really a, a left-wing province. Not to, not to say there weren't you know, strong uh, dimensions of that in terms of uh, governments and, and government policies. But Saskatchewan, to me, was a pretty pragmatic place. And, and you know, you could recognize that if you want to go back a number of years, uh, particularly in rural Saskatchewan, where uh, provincially people were electing the CCF NDP and federally they were electing progressive conservative members of parliament. So there was this kind of switching back between the conservatives federally and the NDP CCF uh, uh, provincially. Uh, so I just I saw this as a story that... Um, uh, extends over many years. So I, uh, you know, how do you, uh, you know, get at this sort of evolution and the, the change that took place? So I, uh, I decided to, to begin the story in the late 1960s, in large part because that's when I came of age in terms of politics and some of my more, more vivid memories uh, stretch back to that, to that, that time. And uh, I, I felt that from the late 60s to the late 90s was really a transformational time in terms of um, you know, politics and, econom- and economics, not just provincially and nationally, but internationally. Some major events took place during that period, and they had a tremendous effect on Saskatchewan. So I go through that period, and basically the story, I would say, is more about the decline of the NDP and the in- inability of the NDP to adapt to this new world that emerged uh, in- during that period. Uh, and as a result, the rise of the Saskatchewan Party in what is, uh, you know, a province that I think is has been pretty pragmatic uh, over the years. And the other dimension to it is the populism that is very much a factor in Saskatchewan politics has been for for generations that always is kind of sort of lurking below the surface. And you would see manifestations of it on occasion. Uh, Tommy Douglas was an agrarian populist, and that was very much sort of the the, um, uh, the driving force, the heart and soul of the CCF and its, and its uh, rural policies. Um, then there was the, the, uh, the Blakeney government was very much more technocratic, and I think it lost it, many of its sort of populist roots during that period, and I think uh, didn't fairly reflect the, um, you know, the, the interests of, of Saskatchewan during a period when things were changing, particularly as it relates to the farm economy. So I think all these factors together led to uh, what became the demise of the NDP and the emergence of this other party, that the Saskatchewan party, that I would uh, argue is more reflective of the Saskatchewan of today, which is uh, one that is um, where the where, where, uh, agricultural economy is very vibrant, enormous wealth in rural Saskatchewan, and we've seen the demise of orderly marketing, and the NDP has had no ability to adjust to that new reality in terms of rural Saskatchewan, and that is really a at the, at the root of uh, the NDP's demise, to my mind, coupled with uh, what I believe, and you mentioned the family of Crown Corporations, which was a major sort of uh, um, economic uh, uh, focus of the NDP in the 1970s, uh, and when there was the privatization that happened in the 1980s under the Divine government, it was very much sort of a populist government when it was elected. I believe the NDP lost its economic identity when, when public ownership, uh, was taken off the taken off the agenda in Saskatchewan. It's never really returned. So, what does the NDP stand for? It's lost its, I believe, its economic 
uh, center of gravity, and it's also lost touch with rural Saskatchewan. So we are where we are today. All right, Dwayne, you lived through this. What's your take on Dale's take? Well, first of all, uh, David, I just want to say thank you for inviting uh, myself and uh, the team to be here. But my uh, my view um, in reading the book is I loved it. I loved Dale's writing. I liked when he um, wrote columns in the, in the Leader Post for the 15 or so years we worked together in the legislature. And I loved this book. And I think um, historically, uh, reading about Gardner and Tommy and uh, Ross Thatcher brought back very vivid um, recollections because there was a period of time when um, um, obviously it was in my lifetime and I was sitting around the caucus and cabinet table making someone helping make some of the decisions that Dale is talking about and I, I think that the book in um, large part is bang on where I, where I um, uh, leave and have a, a different point of view is in fact how much Saskatchewan has changed from an agrarian socialist uh, roots to where we are now. And it's true that the pendulum that Blakeney had taken it to with the resource ownership through Sask Oil and the Potash Corporation and Sask, uh, uh, Sask Mining, um, those were privatized by the divine government. And his plan was to privatize all of the crowns. Um, the Waterloo came, I believe it was in 1999 election when um, um, the battle was really around the privatization of, uh, or in not in 1999, but in 1991, when the battle was around the privatization of Sask Energy, which was the beginning of the following of Maggie Thatcher's uh, policy of getting rid of all government ownership. That was a, a battle that really uh, decided that the Crown Corporations, the family, the utilities, SAS Power, SAS Tel, SGI, uh, were not going to be privatized, and they haven't been privatized. And when Bradwell took over uh, wisely, he understood that that battle he wasn't going to revisit and really, the NDP at that point in time moved to the left, and Brad Wall moved in and ran a government and continues to run a government, the SAS party, very similar to what Roy Romano would have run or I would have run if I were there. Uh, and in fact, the role of the crowns today, uh, the role of the credit unions, the co-ops, the co-ops dominate the environment in rural Saskatchewan, in retail, in fuel, the refineries building of billions of dollar uh, extension, doing biofuel, using canola. So the role of the co-ops and the agrarian social, uh, socialism that Lips had talked about in the Oval in the Midwest, United States, and Saskatchewan is very, very much alive with our credit unions and, and farm credit corporation. What's, what, what isn't the same, and I think the book might have looked at more closely, is what happened to the NDP in the period after the defeat um, of, um, of the government and why haven't we recovered the way Rachel Notley is recovering in Alberta against all the odds? Why we're popular in BC? Why the NDP is four points ahead in Manitoba? Uh, the, what has changed fundamentally in Saskatchewan is the New Democratic Party, uh, which has become, in my view, um, an apologetic, pathetic, a political organization unable to define the character of the leader of the government to look at who that person is and do it in a critical analysis. Um, how is it that Scott Moe is the most popular premier in Canada? Largely, it's because nobody in the media or in the opposition ever says anything negative about him. 
um, why is it that the scandals, the Vinci uh, potential scandal of an overrun of $1.6 billion on a bypass around the little city of Regina has never had the word Vinci construction of Paris, France asked in question period. And um, I think what has changed in Saskatchewan is that the NDP has become a shadow of the fighting party it was under Blakeney, Tommy, or Roy Romano. Uh, can, I, can I just say, uh, I know, Corey, you want to get in here, but, but sure. uh, I don't disagree with Dwayne saying, but nobody knows what the NDP stands for. And Dwayne, you were, you were leader of the NDP. You took over from Warren Calvert. Exactly. Uh, 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 and uh, you said that the NDP moved to the left, I think you suggested, and then somehow, I guess, a wall became with the Saskatchewan more centrist. In fact, the Calvert government cut corporate, uh, the royalties for, for resources, cut taxes, was seen as very centrist, right? Yeah. Uh, and and uh, they, they still, still lost. The fact of the matter is nobody knows what the NDP stands for, whether economically or in terms of rural Saskatchewan. I mean, but that's, they, because, that, but that's our fault. Um, and, I, and I take um, responsibility. I was there and leader. But the, the fact that they don't fight like a Gordon McMurchy or a Murray Kosky and stand up in the house and say, hey, look, you guys, why are you wasting this money? What? They don't do that anymore and they won't do it anymore. Um, when I came back and became leader after 10 years being away, I couldn't believe it was the same political party as I left in 2000. It had become a basically an apologetic group of um, party members who if somebody whispered at them, they would apologize and, and uh, turn the other cheek. Now, when or why that happened, um, I mean, you can, uh, you can go through it and see when that happened, but they will not ask the tough questions anymore that need to be answered. And unless you do as a party, the way Rachel Notley is doing in Alberta, she kicks the shit out of the leader of the uh, Conservative Party every day. She drove Jason Kenney right out of office. And she is painting a pretty ugly oh. picture of Danielle Smith right now. Should a white paper still be called a white paper in an increasingly paperless society? This thought occurred to me at 3 a.m. recently, and I apologize for this little glimpse into my strange, tortured life. Regardless, we're at the end of our storytelling journey here, Hurley Burleyites, about TELUS's Spectrum White Paper, reforming Canadian spectrum policy for 5G and beyond. You can find it online at telus.com slash spectrum policy. If you haven't yet clicked through and you're interested in the good that connectivity can produce in our lives, I humbly suggest you check it out. TELUS has been compiling research from all over the world of how spectrum policy can be used to advance social, economic, and environmental objectives. The timing of all this couldn't be better because, as I speak these words, the millimeter wave consultation is underway to determine how the next auction of spectrum in this country should be framed. Not only that, but Innovation Science and Economic Development Canada, I said, is also currently exploring how spectrum policy can intersect with our desired societal outcomes in their spectrum outlook, a five-year plan for managing this vital resource. So, back to the white paper. In it, TELUS thoughtfully puts forward a number of spectrum policy solutions, all supported by international best practices. It, too, presents a long-term view. The intention of all of it is simply this, getting the most spectrum in use and doing good for Canadians as quickly as possible, because connecting people to what matters most is what matters most to TELUS. Again, check it out for yourself at telus.com slash spectrum policy. Okay, let's well, get Corey I, I, to jump in here. Corey, <laughs> you're, you're, you're of a different generation than the rest of the three of us. So while the yeah. three of us sort of were paying a lot of attention while the NDP were in their, long, in their long tail demise, you've seen the rise of the SAS party um, in the province and being part of the rise of the SAS party. What do you attribute this one party rule too. Yeah, well, I, I think there, there are a number of things at play. Like I, I 
you know, I, I would agree that I don't think the province has changed as much as some people might think. Uh, uh, I like to uh, I like to say that Saskatchewan is the home of the communist right. It's uh, it's <laughs> it's, ele- it's electing conservatives, but uh, is still very comfortable having the only uh, uh, government owned telecom company uh, left on, on the continent, if not the Western world. So you know, there, there's uh, uh, there's still some 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 strange anomalies in terms of uh, how uh, politics are practiced. You know, uh, Dale goes through. The decision not to uh, to sell uh, uh, allow the sale of uh, 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 PCS to BHP Billiton, which is still one of the strangest episodes I think I've I've seen in uh, uh, in uh, Canadian politics, where a, a privately owned company is bo- is blocked as if it is a crown corporation from from selling its assets and done by a, done done so by a supposedly conservative government. So, you know, obviously there is there is. Um, uh, elements that have have stayed constant through Saskatchewan's politics uh, and, and are still there today. There's, uh, you know, I, I'd say more similarities in style uh, between uh, Tommy Douglas and Brad Wall than either one of them. Uh, you know, if Tommy were alive today, would 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 want to admit. Uh, you know, there there's there's uh, and uh, you go through that a fair bit, uh, Dale, in your book in terms of the the sort of populist nature that was there. But I think insofar as something has been lost, it is that populist element. You know, I think the NDP has had some of the same problems that we've seen elsewhere in the country, uh, particularly at the federal level, uh, where it's become a party of interest groups and of uh, urban issues and urban ideas, uh, whether, they're, uh, whether they're related to the environment or whether they're related to identity politics. They're more values-based issues that are that are uh, urban in nature, and even in the larger cities of of Saskatoon and Regina, they're they're small cities by by anyone else's standards. There's still a connection to uh, uh, rural values and and uh, uh, a different frame of mind than you're going to find in downtown Toronto or downtown Ottawa or downtown Vancouver. So I, I think some of that is, has has slipped away from the NDP in terms of how they frame themselves. Um, you know, in terms of the actual change in government, I think a lot can be attributed just to the NDP having been in power for a long time. You know, as you point out, Calvert uh, did move the party. Uh, I'd say not even to the center. I'd say to the right, in terms of uh, tax cuts and and uh, royalty holidays for oil and gas exploration. Those are some pretty conservative ideas. Um, but uh, you know, after that period of time in in government, I think it, people wanted a change and. Um, uh, I think they wanted to see see a renewal. So, I mean, the, the the big thing for me to watch is rural Saskatchewan, because uh, when I first got involved in politics, the only reliably non NDP ridings in rural Saskatchewan were along what Ross Thatcher called the Liberal L, the western side of the province that bordered Alberta and the southern ridings that bordered the United States. Right, um, not including Shonovan, um, and uh, and and so those every other part in the rest of rural Saskatchewan, part of it was reliably NDP, and the rest of them were swing ridings that might go to the NDP or to whoever was the non NDP party at any non NDP option at any given point in time, and now. There are no writings for the NDP in rural Saskatchewan, and the margins are outrageous. Like the Conservatives win with over 70, the SAS party, sorry, wins with over 70% of the vote. Well, the, so, they, so Dwayne, let me start with you, and I want to hear from everybody about this, but Dwayne, let me start with you because you won the Shaunaman riding in 1978 um, and, uh, and, and won it again, I think, in 1982. Um, and um, what is is Shaunavan different now than it was then, or are the NDP different now than they were then, or both? Well, I think I think it's both. But uh, in my view, the control that the NDP should have and could have if they did the work, for example, in Shaunavan. Um, when I was the member in 78 and 82, we had over a thousand members um, who were 
card carrying paid up. They had to pay five or ten dollars to buy this little slip of paper. And you went around and you visited with Tom and Mary and Joe, and that was a big part of your job. You went and sat in the living room or in the kitchen, had a cup of coffee, and at the end of the conversation, you said, here's your membership for the cover for 1979, and they would sign on. They were then a a member. And when I left in uh, 2000, that system was still in place of going around, similar to the Canadian Wildlife Federation or organizations that do that work. When I came back, I said, um, where's the membership at? Well, Shonovan had a membership of about 50 members. And I said, what the hell's going on? Why do, what are you doing? Well, we don't do it that way. We're doing it online and we're doing it without the membership. And I think there was a fundamental shift that took place of that organizational structure. And I don't think you can ever get that back, uh, David. I think that's a, a, an era that is gone, but it changed fundamentally. And th- that loyalty that we were uh, gaining by the candidate or the MLA actually going and do those visiting, um, that doesn't exist anymore. But for example, in Shaunavan, there are as many teachers and civil servants and uh, people on welfare and poor people and people below the, the median income who we should be able to appeal to if we talk to them. But we don't talk to them anymore because we've defined ourselves as an urban party. My view is, is that the NDP have left the people It's not that the people have left the NDP, which gives hope because that tells you that some young Turk came up and did the work in Shaunavan, went around to see everybody. I think there's as much uh, to be gained there as there was in 1978 when uh, when we won there. But it's going to take a lot of work and a change in strategy by the party. Yeah. Could I? uh, Yeah. Go ahead, Dale. Yeah. Uh, well, I agree that, those, that that's a factor, what Dwayne just pointed to in terms of the organization and the lack of sort of on-the-ground work. But I, but I think it's, it goes much deeper than that. And really, if you go back, uh, early in the book, I talk about the 1982 election when Grant Devine won and how Devine uh, or the NDP in those days, and Dwayne, you were actively involved in this, th- th- this was a campaign about saving the crow rate and essentially the defense of orderly marketing and the family farm. These were battles from previous decades, which go back to kind of the roots, the agrarian roots of the NDP, which at one time were very, very important. But the farm economy was changing, and the NDP didn't clue into that fact. And they were fighting, you know, for a a rural Saskatchewan that was in the midst of change at that time. And that's ultimately where we are today, and it's happened over the last 20 years. Uh, And the NDP has never been able to reconcile itself to that reality of rural Saskatchewan. Like what the, the NDP used to be about orderly marketing, the family farm, the crow rate, the wheat board, uh, Sask wheat pool, all this, they're all gone. It's all gone. So how does the NDP, how does the NDP remain or become relevant again? And it, it beyond just sort of organization, but you got to have a message you're taking to these people that, that, that is meaningful for them. And the, the NDP that. has lost it. In, in 1978 and 82, I didn't win the farm vote in Shaunavan. And I didn't even spend much time campaigning in at Farmgate because at that t- by that time in 78 and 82, if you look at the polls in Shaunavan, they were already going conservative. Where our vote was is in Main Street, Shaunavan. And per capita, there are more poor people in the towns and villages in rural Saskatchewan than there are in the city, which makes it very fertile ground. The other thing that has happened is there are probably half as many farm gate farmers in 2022 as there was in 1978. The farm vote in uh, in the riding of Shaunavan is almost insignificant. Um, The NDP has to focus, as we did in 78 and in 82, not on farm gate vote, but on town gate vote, because that's where 
the vote has been since 78 and has even increased as a percentage of the vote in Shaunavan. The farmer vote has actually gone down as a percentage and the number of teachers and civil servants has actually gone up. But I think you're, you're conflating farm and rural and and those are two different things. Like it's, you know, the, And I think it misses the larger point of of what I think is the staying power of the Saskatchewan party and part of uh, why it's been so successful and continues to be so successful under Scott Moe. And and that's that it's successfully defined itself as the party of the flag. You know, if you look at the enduring success that the Liberal Party has had federally over the last, you know, 150 years uh, in the country, it's because they've successfully been the party of the flag, right down to the flag looking like their party logo. (laughs) I, it's uh, the Saskatchewan party is uh, perceived by by voters in the provinces as the ones looking after the interests of of uh, uh, of the province and that the opposition is not uh, the handful of no name NDP uh, MLAs uh, in the legislature in Regina. The opposition is Justin Trudeau. The opposition is what's happening in Ottawa uh, uh, around resource issues. Um, uh, et cetera. So uh, taxation policy or things like, you know, the long gun registry, another, you know, huge galvanizing issue uh, that separates uh, rural Canadians from, uh, from urban Canadians. And, uh, and being voiced for those kinds of issues uh, is, uh, I think, part of, uh, of where the success is. And, and, you know, you're continuing to see that today. You know, one of the main announcements that, the Mo government's made in the last couple of months is saying it's not going to enforce federal law when it comes to uh, uh, the current uh, ban on uh, certain long guns and, and handguns. So I, I, I think feeding into those issues is, is really, um, really central to this storyline. Remember shopping? How easy it used to be? Remember the days before we started begging dealers to let us pay full price for a new car? Remember fully stocked inventory? Remember being happily ignorant of the term supply chain? The days before China started choking off our choices by shutting down entire mega factories because of a single COVID diagnosis, and Russia began savagely disrupting grain and fuel supplies and Brexit and all those other things economists refer to as externalities and the rest of us refer to as well, well, you know. Anyway, let's talk internalities for lack of another term. Pretty clearly, the NAFTA trading bloc is going to have to make some new arrangements. Onshoring, to use another economist term. The fact is, our domestic supply chains work very well indeed, and we'd all be better off if we relied on them more. Our sponsor, CN, is the veins and arteries of Canada's supply chains, and a good chunk of America's too. And CN keeps cargo moving on time. The railway is delighted to boast that last week it moved a record amount of grain out of Western Canada. 806,000 tons in seven days. Grain season is in full swing right now, and there had been some gloomy predictions about whether farmers would be able to get their crop to market on time this year. Well, they have. Witness last week, witness last month, the second best September ever for grain movement out of Western Canada. CN knows the trick is to synchro mesh all the moving parts of the machine to develop accurate forecasting, ensure supply chain partners collaborate, and to move fast when kinks develop. As when a bridge fire shut down a CN branch line in northern Alberta October 5th, a CN crew worked around the clock, moving the equivalent of 20 Olympic-sized swimming pools of earth and rock, laying new tracks and reopening the line to grain shipments within a week. The world is less reliable, but CN's trains keep leaving and arriving on time. Cargo has to move, period. I, I agree, Corey, and I think um, when you compare, uh, as Dale did, I think uh, accurately, Tommy Douglas um, and the populism to Tommy Douglas, uh, what Tommy did every time the polls started to go down, he would um, instigate a fight with uh, the federal government, with the Canadian Pacific Railway and the, the banks, and sure. then his poll numbers would go up. And what Scott Moe and the SAS party have been able to successfully do is as soon as their numbers slip a little bit, they find uh, a good enemy, if you know what I mean, and they go to war uh, for that reason. And they're excellent at it. But, but everybody does cancel. this in every yeah, province. I mean, every that, government does this. No, They don't see, get 70 percent of the vote. 
Yeah, and See, so what? did Ellen Blakeney, Dwayne, in the 70s. The oh, battles I, with, I, the, with, with Ottawa were central to the, to the agenda. See, yeah. I think that that's my point, though, is that the government isn't doing anything. What is fundamentally different is what the opposition isn't doing. And if you look at the period after Grant Devine won in 1982, and you compare that opposition of Alan Blakeney and Murray Kosky as diverse and as un. Um, um, thinkable as it was that you would have that rump of a party in opposition and look at the fight that they put up to actually get 3,000 more votes in the next election uh, than but, Grant Devine and then compare it to what the NDP is doing now, there is no fight in the NDP. But, but between, between, look at, if you're, if you are in the Saskatchewan public, you know, it, your, your economy is, is more uh, heavily oriented towards resource development and agriculture being one of the, you know, obviously the largest of, of the parts of the resource economy, carbon taxes, uh, et cetera. These are, these are terrible, terrible policies for the economy of the province. You know, we are having to sell your product into a global commodity market uh, at a huge competitive disadvantage to farmers in the United States that are not having to pay more for fuel, that are not having, you know, federal officials coming around and talking about, net, you know, no net increases in fertilizer use, et cetera. This is putting a, an absolute noose around the neck of the economy. And you have the federal NDP whose entire pitch is that the government isn't doing enough on this whose arguments on things like, you know, the gun control uh, bills are that they're not going far enough. Like it, it's, it's everything that's bad, but with a volume turned up. And so I, I don't think it's about, you know, going and hectoring more in the legislature. Uh, the problem is that the, that the NDP's brand nationally and how they frame themselves, you know, in the larger market is the exact opposite of what's in the financial and economic interest of the province. And, and, you know, how do you, how do you get through that? You know, I, I saw in the news in the past week, you know, the, the, uh, the NDP was saying they didn't want to have Jagmeet Singh come to their convention and speak. And Scott Moe is putting out press releases telling everyone that Jagmeet Singh's coming to, to speak at the NDP convention and to come and pay attention to what he has to say. Like, I think yeah, that and in the, a nutshell and the, and the, and captures what the, the issue is here. And the NDP is silent on that. That is my yeah. point. Well, if yeah, that was but, happening you know, in Alberta, Rachel Notley, Rachel Notley would be yelling from the top of the roof. Well, how, but, how but, in, but, in, but in Alberta, that Alberta, the NDP is going to win when there's Rachel, a carbon tax. Rachel Notley doesn't want to see Jagmeet Singh. Rachel Notley doesn't no, want to no, have Jagmeet Singh. No, but my point is, why is, the, why is the NDP doing so poorly in Saskatchewan and so well kicking the Whoa. ass? Of the well, conservatives but they're not. In, uh, they're, they're, in Alberta, they're, they're not. They're four or five uh, they're, points ahead. Ke Jason Kenny committed sepika. <laughs> That's what happened. No, no, that isn't what happened. What happened is that Rachel Notley pointed out every mistake. And if you call Jason Kenny a son of a bitch every day for two years, guess what's going to happen? The public will start saying it. We did it with yeah. Grant Devine. Grant Devine was a PhD economist brilliant, good-looking, handsome, wore $1,000 suits, but we called him what? We said, open the books and jail the crooks. And we said it over and over and over again. And what did the public say by 1986? And then finally in 1991, they opened the books and what did they do? 15 of them were charged and went to jail. Well, it helped. So, Dale, so Dale, Dale, I want to come back to something, Dale, that, something that Corey said about um, the central Canadian brand now of the NDP on. So is does the NDP just have a branding problem? I mean, they were originally organic to Saskatchewan of Saskatchewan, <clears throat> totally identified with Saskatchewan. <clears throat> and now. Perhaps the image of the party in the province is driven more by what happens at the federal level than at the provincial level. Or is there just no room in Saskatchewan for a competing approach to government right now? Uh, David, I think it's both. I think I think the sort of the federal factor is really critical these days in, in Saskatchewan politics. As we all know, sort of the disdain for, Pierre, for Justin Trudeau in Saskatchewan is incredibly you know, deep. 
And there's real anger against the federal government, which is what Scott Moe and the SAS party plays to at all times. And this puts a huge squeeze on the NDP in Saskatchewan. So you have this, and we talk about populism and, and, and the sort of the influence or the effect of, you know, battles with Ottawa, what it has to, in terms of Saskatchewan politics. Well, we're in the midst of it right now. So you've, you've got a federal government that's seen as really not in the, the, serving the interests of Saskatchewan and a Saskatchewan party that's challenging it. You know, whether you agree or disagree, that's the, that's the frame we're in right now. How does the NDP fit itself into that, particularly when you have a federal party that is supporting Trudeau and keeping him in office? And you can see it where the NDP is totally disarmed, like on the carbon tax. Uh, they're silent on it, right? They don't want to engage on it because they know of the negative effects it has politically. So they, they, they try to avoid the, the subject entirely. So you've got Scott Moe taking on the federal government. And, and people can criticize, rightly so, this paper that Scott Moe put out recently saying it's going to, the cost of uh, federal policies, climate policies, are going to cost the province what was it, $111 billion over the next 13 years to 2035? And you can say, well, that's ridiculous. Uh, that doesn't take into account the benefits that come back like the rebate for the carbon tax. But okay, fair enough. So let's say it's 50% wrong. So it's only $55 billion that's costing the province. The reality is uh, he has raised a, an important point that the climate agenda is not going to be painless. It's going to cost people. It's going to cost economies and individuals. That's the simple reality of it. We can argue about the magnitude of it, but that's that's the truth. So how does the NDP even engage on that issue without being seen as supporting uh, the federal government and Justin Trudeau? Well, 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 I think there's like there are easy ways for it to do it. And if you're looking at, I don't think it's just this crass political bomb throwing that, that Dwayne's talking about that Rachel Notley's doing right. I think she is successfully uh, created a brand for herself within the province where she will fight for pipelines. She will uh, actually advocate for Alberta's interests within Confederation while also offering an alternative government to, uh, to the Conservatives. Uh, you know, and, and I think that's the sweet spot for the NDP provincially if they wanted to come back. But you can't, you can't uh, uh, get there unless you're going to articulate policies that are are broadly in the interests of the province and and things like you know and I'll come back to carbon tax again because I think it's a central central issue. Um, there are very credible uh, climate change plans uh, out there in the world, including the one advocated by President uh, Biden, uh, that do not involve a carbon tax. There are alternative ways of approaching these problems, uh, and and you know, you have to have the courage of voice if you're uh, if you want to have a place in the political. Uh, spectrum uh, in the province to uh, to make the case for for an alternative way that's in the province's interest uh, at, at the same time as taking the issue seriously and 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 I just don't see that happening. I think they've just bought into this you know this this frame that if you are not in favor of a carbon tax, uh, then you're you know you're a climate uh, you're a climate denier, and you know this this is uh, I think false thinking. Would it help well, the NDP? I, I, to, would it help the NDP to break away from the federal NDP and create their own provincial brand? Well, I, I think that the Liberals in Saskatchewan tried that, and I, I just don't think it works. It's sort of like um, trying to pretend you're not a relative of of um, someone. I mean, you can pretend, but if you're that's your name, then you pretty well have to uh, live with it. And and hey, it's working out for Herschel Walker. Yeah, the, uh, but, but, but Corey, I think the one way that Saskatchewan NDP should be dealing with the carbon tax is um, um, extending it to a form of, of trade of carbon where the farmers would get credit for sequestering um, carbon. And um, I don't know why they don't offer that up as um, as an alternative. We did have a carbon trade where we were getting paid 20 or $30 an acre 10 years ago, that's gone away, but there is a way to use the carbon tax to actually support the farm community uh, by using it not to as a social program to help people who are struggling, but actually paying it out to people who are doing something to improve the environment. Well, that's part, that's part of it. And I think that it would be a more sensible approach, but it, it's also you know true that, that, uh, <laughs> What's what's in the interest of of an, a larger industry 
uh, is not going to be necessarily the same as, as, as how it's being framed right now. Like we could have carbon emissions go up in a province like Saskatchewan because we're developing more uh, energy resources and we're growing more crops. And then that would be good for the global uh, you know, carbon emission environment because you, you'd be displacing coal that's being used in China. You'd be growing crops more efficiently with a lower carbon footprint here than some other part of the globe. So like, I, I, I think we have to have like a, a larger view of some of these things, some more nuance in those debates. But, you know, before you can get there, you, you people have got to think that you have a feeling that you're actually on their side, that you're actually looking at this from a perspective of, I'm getting, a, you know, seeking election in the province of Saskatchewan. And my number one job before anything else is to defend the economic interests and life and prosperity and communities of the place where I'm running for office. And I don't think anyone has a sense that that's what's going on uh, with the opposition parties in Saskatchewan. I think they believe that intrinsically about the Saskatchewan party. And they see that in the way it presents itself, usually in opposition to Ottawa. Uh, but not not only Ottawa, you know, the, the same old thing about, you know, uh, railways and banks and all of that, that's still there. That's what, you know, the, the fight with BHP Billiton was about. Like, there is still that suspicion about central Canadian institutions and cartels that, uh, that plays itself out in the politics. They could jump on that, too. You know, it's a big opportunities, I think, around some of the, the cost of living increases, you know, that are, I, I think, uh, uh, areas where, where there's, you know, political hay to be made. Indigenous youth are the fastest growing population in the country. They are the leaders and agents of change for their communities and the country as a whole. And they deserve access to education and meaningful livelihoods that embrace their cultures and worldviews. Curly Burleyites, this is why the MasterCard Foundation LV program works with Indigenous youth and partners across Canada, transforming education and employment systems to embrace Indigenous approaches and values. More than 10,700 Indigenous youth have been supported by the LV program to date. Their goal is to support 100,000 Indigenous young people in accessing post-secondary education and attaining meaningful employment by 2030. For more information, visit takingflighttogether.ca and tune in on October 26th at 9 p.m. on APTN for the official launch of LV, celebrating the successes of Indigenous youth. So I, I drove us to talk about rural Saskatchewan, but here's a question that I'm interested in. Cities are places that it is challenging for conservatives to find votes these days, including in Alberta, which is why Rachel Notley is a threat to defeat the United Conservative Party in Alberta, but not in Regina or Saskatoon. What's different about those cities than other cities in the country? Well, well my, 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 my view is there's nothing different, um, and it comes back to my thesis that this is not so much about the SAS party, but is really about the NDP. Uh, and we don't speak to the issues. For, for uh, um, my, my hearing is Pierre Polyev speaks more to the issues of uh, Regina working people than the NDP. Um, our voice is solidly ab on, and only about health care, how we're going to spend more, spend more on health care. But it doesn't speak to the issues of um, the working people in Regina or Saskatoon. Our voice is quiet. It's um, uh, soft. And I just don't think that's what works in politics today. And it didn't work yesterday. There's a similarity about politics. It's loud and proud. Um, and um, I see um, other parties doing it. And I think the day the NDP sits down and figures it out and says, look, we're, we're not doing our job. I'm not sure why we're getting our paycheck because we're, we're simply not doing what we're being paid to do, which is in our name, it's called opposition. It means oppose, uh, and it means offer up positive solutions to deal with working people. And we're just not hitting the nail. And that um, comes back to my original thing, uh, uh, belief that um, uh, it's more about what the, the NDP is not doing than it is about what the government is doing. But, Dale, but Dwayne, what's your take that's on this? true. That, 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 that's very true, Dwayne. But but you also have to have a message that's going to resonate with people. 
Exactly. And we talked to, well, we talked about Regina and David's point about, you know, working people, uh, you know, they, they sh- this should be the sweet spot for, uh, for the NDP. Well, tying it to the, uh, the climate issue and energy, uh, at the north side of Regina is Everest Steel Plant. They produce steel for pipelines. And what has the NDP position been on sort of expanded pipelines in Canada? In Saskatchewan, oh. it's been very muted, very muted, and leaning towards you know, opposition to further pipeline development, like Keystone is, is a good example. So here you have a party that's supposedly representing working people, and you got all these people working at the steel mill, and you have an NDP that's essentially arguing against the interests of the steel mill. So it goes beyond just sort of... Uh, well, the BC the, NDP have figured that out, Dale, right? The BC NDP, yeah. Yeah, the BC sure. NDP so have has, figured that so out. And so has Notley. Notley supports so pipeline, pipeline expansion. So it's about the, the NDP's lack of any kind of message to give people. It's one thing to say you've got to speak for working people. Well, you better speak in terms that they understand. And the NDP doesn't do that. The NDP needs to modernize itself. It's got to adapt to the reality of today, and it hasn't done that. It's still stuck in the past yeah. in many regards. Well, you, you see this you see this in the federal NDP as well, where you know we we often have these arguments on the curse of politics. But you know the, the NDP uh, will make statements about representing working Canadians uh, because they were historically true once upon a time. And just say them like it's a statement of, of fact, like, like, you know, God's come down from heaven and divine that the NDP shall represent working people, all facts be damned. Well, if you don't actually represent people's interests in a certain area long enough, eventually they figure it out. And, uh, and I, I think this is the, the larger change that's been happening in, in politics, like not just in, you know, in Saskatchewan or in Canada generally or in Ontario, but like across Western countries where you're seeing more and more working class voters, people who, you know, as uh, uh, Monty McNaughton likes to say, shower at the end of the day instead of uh, the beginning, um, are, uh, uh, are seeing their interests reflected by, by, by conservative parties and that the progressive left has abandoned them. You know, in the United States, the Democratic Party wants, wants to shut down all the coal mines. Well, the coal miners of America used to be the largest contributor to the Democratic Party in the United States. Uh, you know, the Teamsters, you know, people driving trucks, they want to shut, they want to shut down these industries. They want to heavily regulate them. They're, they, you know, they want to, they're more likely to want to have uh, an AI system with an automated driver driving that, that 18 wheeler than some, somebody who's actually a worker. So, you know, I, I think that the fundamental gap is one around representing uh, or giving voice to, to enough voters to actually have a constituency large enough to elect government. And they just don't. Okay. Corey, well, when, when, the, Corey, when Calvert was defeated, when Calvert was defeated, was it your impression at the time that the NDP would never win again? Um, I, I, I don't think you ever want to say never, but I, I think it's as often happens, you know, you get elected one time too many, you know, like the... Uh, I think that I think yeah, I'm somewhat, fam- I'm somewhat it's, familiar uh, yeah. with it, Corey. <laughs> but like, <laughs> you, know, you, can, you can you can win one too many, you know, and and, and certainly, yeah, I know that this is you know 2018, uh, certainly a you know example of that in Ontario. But you know, it it was it was time for the government to have gone before, and the pent up demand around that, I think, kind of you know made made the the ultimate loss that much bigger than it would have otherwise been. I think in combination with with just the pure raw political talent that is Brad Wall, uh, I think the combination of those two things really really blew the doors off it when when it happened. And you know, uh, it was clear that Brad was going to be there for quite a long time. He was a different kind of politician. You know, I'd, I'd, being at the press conference in '99 where we kind of lost the election, uh, 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 you know, in a 45 minute press conference where where uh, uh, Elwin Hermanson. <laughs> Uh, who's, a, who's a very, very smart, intelligent guy who I, I, I'm very fond of uh, as an individual, but, you know, kind of got tripped up on the crowns question. And uh, the answer to what are you going to do with, with the crowns was, well, uh, you know, uh, crown corporate privatizations, if necessary, but not necessarily privatization, which ended up being 
you know, the worst of all worlds. People who wanted privatization didn't think he was going to do it. And people who didn't want privatization thought he was going to. And, you know, not everyone, obviously, but enough people that he ended up losing both sides of the same argument on a key question. That's always a bad place to be, as you know, David, in a campaign. You want to you wanna win one side or the other. <laughs> and, right. and we ended up win- losing both. So I got a question, Dale, I want you to start. And then Dwayne, I want you to back clean up on this. We've been talking when we talked about the NDP versus now, we've really been talking about Blakeney versus now. But there was this government intervening, the Romano government that ended with Lauren Calvert. I was working for Paul Martin when that was happening and really watching the Saskatchewan government through that prism. What was that government? Was that a socialist government? Was that a neoliberal government? What was that version of the NDP and what kind of brand confusion about the NDP did that government create? Well, I think, you know, as I say in the book, uh, the critical sort of dimension of the Roman government, at least the one that had the longest uh, long term effect, was uh, its policy on rural hospitals and the need to. Uh, you know, reform health care in Saskatchewan, which was so given the fiscal situation they, in, they inherited from the divine government, which was a, a real disaster. Bankruptcy. No tr- Bankruptcy. Well, uh, yeah, on the verge of. And, uh, you know, the government obviously had to uh, uh, take action on this. And Duane, you would know this intimately because you were, you know, in cabinet uh, at, the, at that time. And the decision on rural hospitals to close 50 or, uh, yeah, close 52 uh, chronic uh, or acute care hospitals, so to speak, in rural Saskatchewan was the right thing to do. But it desperately harmed the, the NDP politically in, in rural Saskatchewan because this was, you know, hospitals were very important to these communities that Dwayne talks about or in terms of the, the communities in rural Saskatchewan. Um, and It's the end of your a, town when the hospital closes. What's that? It's the end of your town when the hospital closes. Well, that's how people, uh, Dwayne, he can speak to this. That's how many people felt. Now, having said all that, it's worth noting that in the subsequent election of 95, the NDP won a majority. And, and, and a lot of uh, rural seats, I believe, Dwayne, in, 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 that, in that election. Uh, and I think a lot of that was sort of uh, a hangover from the divine government and the bad order that it left and all the... the, the, the um, well, they were all in jail. Well, many of them were. Exactly. Yeah, they weren't happened. even second, right? The Linda Haverstock's liberals were yeah, second. Yeah, it came in second, exactly. Um, so uh, and I think the big mistake, though, that Romano made, um, and Duane, I don't know if you were there for the coalition government with the liberals in 99, but yeah. to me, that was, uh, that was a fatal mistake uh, made by the government at that time because the NDP was, it was clearly – Kind of in decline, it was clinging to power, so it reached out to the to liberals to hang on to it. And the Saskatchewan Party was sort of a rising force in, in politics. And uh, I believe all it did was delay the you know the transition that was already underway. So uh, I think that the, uh, the rural hospital issue remains uh, a big big issue in rural Saskatchewan to this very day. And the Saskatchewan party uses it against the NDP at every, every opportunity. Well, there, there's a, there's a fundamental challenge for delivery and healthcare in a province like Saskatchewan as well, where, you know, uh, farming by profession, I believe is still the most dangerous profession in the country. Like it's, it's, um, you know, the, the number of accidents and things that, that can routinely happen as a part of doing your daily business. Um, or, you know, you're at a you're at a mine, or you're you know many other locations. There's 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 a lot of dangers in the workplace and dangers in daily life, and to not have access to quality health care in a timely basis uh, is is something that's not just a you know a notion of what the future of your town is. It's a notion of if you know uh, if I have an accident on my farm or or elsewhere, you know, am I going to live or not? You know, if I have a heart attack, you know, in a, in a rural area, what, what's your what's your health outcome going to be? You know, it, it's 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 a it's a huge challenge, I think, that's unique to uh, a province with as large a land mass and as small a population as Saskatchewan. So, you know, I, I, I feel for the government there of any stripe uh, in trying to to make that work from a financial point of view, because it's, it's not easy. Dwayne, if you could go back to that Romano government, what would you do differently? Well, I think there's um, a couple of things that um, that um, 
we would do differently. One, one is, I think you wouldn't call it hospital closures. You would have left the hospitals open and just changed their mandate because that's basically right. what we did. Um, we changed them to uh, health centers. Um, why, why the name change? Why not just keep calling them hospitals with different services, which is what uh, Scott Moe is wisely doing. The hospital in Shaunavon is no longer a hospital. They don't, they can't, you can't have a baby in Shaunavon if you're a woman and pregnant. Uh, but he knows he's not going to say that's now a health center. He uh, it's now has the big age bigger than ever but they don't offer health services. You have to go to SwiftCurt, which is logical with modern equipment. You cannot have the equipment you need in modern healthcare in Climax and Shaunavon and all these places. But in reality, as many hospitals- If I'd been born in SwiftCurt and instead of Prelate, I'd be so much more <laughs> impressive. <laughs> but but, but the, uh, the fact is that hospitals are changing um, as much now under the SAS party as they were under the Romano government. But we, it, it was a crazy decision to uh, call them health centers and not just leave the hospital sign up and change the mandate. That's one thing. The second thing that I feel uh, uh, like that we should have done is some restructuring of government. And I know I probably am changing a bit of my song now because I think at the time I wanted to keep the RMs in place because uh, uh, of the politics. But the fact is the municipal governments in Saskatchewan are ridiculous. In the town of Shaunavon, which is about 1500, we have five governments. We have the town, uh, the town office and four municipal governments. We almost have more people on council than we have people in the area. I mean, it is absolutely <laughs> ridiculous. We are the most over-governed community in the world. We have more government officials elected. I think we've got 24 elected members in the town of Shaunavon. <laughs> wow. Hey, Dwayne, I, I don't want to put you on this. I do want to put you on the spot. I'm going to put you on the spot. I thought you might give a different answer to my question about what you do differently, because the Romano government had as its finance minister one of the most right wing politicians I have known in Canada, yeah. um, and uh, an absolute free market zealot, anti government. And when I looked at her through that whole period of time, I kept thinking to myself, "What are traditional New Democratic voters thinking about this person?" Yeah, but but you know that um, in um, after Roy left. Um, that individual, um, um, Ms. McKinnon, wanted to be premier. That um, is pretty obvious. Dale, you may have a comment on this. But the fact of the matter is that none of the caucus would support. And uh, the fact is that um, she was our finance minister, but I don't think um, you can say that she was a rock star within the in the party. Um, and having said that, I think there's a bit of... Uh, rewriting of history about the role that she played in balancing the budget in Saskatchewan. All of that heavy work that was done, the planning, the laying it out, the partnership for renewal was all done by um, Ed Tijowski, who was the minister for the first 18 months or two years. It, it, it's true, uh, Janice implemented it, but by then, the ministers who were responsible, the ministers of education, municipal affairs, where the big cuts were coming, and the health department were done by other ministers. So I think that the, the problem with history, it's always rewritten uh, or, or written by the victors. And that's why the issue of hospitals is a bigger issue now than it was in 1995, the uh, the year after we closed them. We won with a majority. I mean, it's a bigger issue now because uh, the victors are writing the history every day about how terrible and disastrous closing those hospitals were when in fact, the hospitals were never closed. They were converted to health centers. And the other thing is not one of them has been reopened by the SAS party over the past 15 years. So, I mean, and I'm not arguing that they're bad for doing it. I think they're good at their job. They, 
say what they need to say. What I'm saying is our party is very bad at selling a message and knowing what the hell we stand for. And that's that will change. And I'm very optimistic that our new leader in Saskatchewan is going to start changing some of that. Yeah. Uh, Tori, when I grew up in Saskatchewan, it was a poor province. It was a have not yeah. province. Yeah. And ha- voted reliably NDP for 40 years. I'm not drawing a correlation between the policy between the policies of NDP governments and uh, being a have not province. In fact, Dale's book concludes that that is not correct. Um, yeah. And um, but what I am saying, what I am questioning is then the resource money came and then Saskatchewan became a relatively wealthy province. How much of it is simply this, that we were socialists when we were poor and we're, and we're, yeah. we're yeah. conservatives when but we're I, wealthy? I, 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 I think that's very much uh, a, a part of it, a, a reason for what's happened in Saskatchewan. I mean, this is a wealthy province. There are, I think our median, median income in Saskatchewan is the second highest in Canada, just behind Alberta's. Uh, and I think there's a, there's a sense in Saskatchewan that we are now a big player. Uh, even globally, because of you know our resources, whether it's oil or potash, uranium, you know our agricultural sector that we that 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 we have a lot going for us. And that's kind of changed attitudes here, and uh, we're a richer province than we were before. So I think that you know way back in the days of the the CCF Douglas and and even into Blakeney, Saskatchewan didn't have that kind of sense of itself and. And things like co-ops and orderly marketing what were in the interests of, of Saskatchewan people and farmers and whatnot. But now there's a new economy out there, and that's all changed. And now self-interest is in uh, a more open economy that we, we currently have today, and that's had big political effects on the province. The province has changed in that sense economically, and politically the NDP has never adjusted to that reality. Yeah, Corey, you were going to say something about yeah, that? Yeah, well, like, I, I want to talk about that because I think this is a big part of it. And, uh, you know, uh, you quote, uh, you know, at some length, the speech that uh, Brad Wall made when he came in, uh, talking about the, the choice between hope and fear, which I think really uh, personifies the change that happened. And, the, and I'd say the biggest change that happened with the Saskatchewan party coming in with Brad Wall uh, was a renewed sense of hope and belief in what the province could do. I think that what had taken route, uh, uh, root rather in, uh, in the province from a, a mentality and mindset was, you know, we're a million people and we're never going to be more than a million people. Or we're, I think, just under a million people. The population hadn't increased since 1930. This is unheard of. Like, this is unheard of elsewhere in the entire Western world, you know, where people uh, would see their kids grow up and move to Alberta. Uh, and, uh, and leave and, you know, and anyone who, you know, and this is, it's a period of time when I left to this period of time when many, many people left the province, uh, there was this feeling that, you know, that you were being asked to accept that the pie was only so big and it was never going to get bigger and that you just had to, you know, diminish your expectations and bring them into alignment with this, this sad reality that, that, uh, you know, things were only going to get worse. Uh, that things were never going to grow and to, you know, have an injection of self-confidence and hope uh, articulated and brought forward. And if I were to say there's, you know, a failure of the Calvert government, it's less on policy and more on that, you know, this, this sort of can't do mentality um, that, uh, that, uh, you know, I think the NDP uh, became highly associated with as a brand. So, you know, um, the change now in terms of, I think, mindset of the province and, and the amount of confidence that, that exists there in the business community uh, 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 is much higher. Like, it's night and day difference. Okay. Corey, can I stick with you and ask you a question I think might be of some interest to people outside Saskatchewan who might be listening? And that is, Mo is so unassailable politically. Why does he feel the need to play footsie with the extreme elements in Saskatchewan politics rather than stand up to them and push them around? Well, I, 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 I guess you're probably talking about, you know, sort of uh, some of the Western separatist sort of notions, that sort of stuff. Is that what you, you mean? Yeah, well, yeah. And I mean, you know, he's, he's, he pays attention to the Buffalo Party in a way that seems yeah. as if he wants to co-opt it rather than confront it. 
Right. Yeah, and I, I, I think it's because at his core, he's a federalist, and and that the the desire to push back against uh, encroachment on resource issues by the federal government is real. And I think the you know the challenges around things like the carbon tax, etc. They're 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 they're, they're maybe not existential to the industry there, but they are certainly the most important issues facing the economy writ large. And there are uh, a whole bunch of people, I think, within Western Canada who are feeling, you know, without voice, you know, they vote overwhelmingly for opposition parties and then see, you know, governments elected with, you know, less than 40% of uh, the vote federally who are imposing, uh, you know, a downtown Toronto uh, view of, of life, the universe and everything on their economy and their way of life. Uh, and, and so, you know, I, I see similarities between Scott Moe and Preston Manning on, on some, some of these things where, where Manning as well, you know, I wanted to see the country work, uh, but, uh, you know, wanted to provide a, a, a uh, federalist alternative to, to that. So I, I think, you know, well, I, I think the, the sentiment for some people of, of Western separation uh, it has a romance to it in the same way that, you know, Quebec separatism does. But, you know, uh, if anyone looks under the hood of that thing, it just doesn't work, right? You know, you can't have uh, two prairie provinces or three prairie provinces landlocked and and uh, without uh, good north-south uh, trans- uh, transportation You're just being polite. Nobody thinks about Manitoba. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> uh, but, you know, the, but the... the, the you know, the view of Haltane, uh, Frederick Haltane, the, 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 uh, 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 the last head of the Northwest Territories and Rupert's Land going, you know, uh, brought forward this idea of instead of having a number of Western Canadian provinces that you should have one uh, the, with a larger population landmass that it can effectively push back against the larger, more populous uh, Central Canadian provinces. Like I, I think there is there is a sense that 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 would have been a better path for some people, and there's a romance associated with that. Uh, and I think there's some political wisdom that you know Canada would look differently if we'd done that. But the fact is, we didn't, and we are where we are. Um, but you know, I, 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 you know, I think he's taking these positions. It's a long way to get to a short answer because they are popular, and they're popular because there is there is some merit to them. You know, and, and that's why I think, you know, how do, how do you get to be really popular someplace? It's not by saying things that people don't agree with. <laughs> <laughs> you sound like a politician, Corey. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I play one on TV. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Dale, let's wrap up. As you look forward, do you see an issue around which all of this could change? Is there some looming thing? happening or about possibly happening in Saskatchewan that could change the political fortunes of the province? I think the short answer, David, is no, not at this point. I think there is uh, some growing uh, uh, pushback to against the, the provincial government with a lot of people. They see it as a government that's... Uh, you know, got too much sort of hubris, right? That uh, that uh, it believes in itself to the extent that it just sort of dismisses uh, any critics. Well, after uh, fifteen years, how can that not be the case? Yeah, well, no, but that's exactly it, and that's that's what uh, when politics changes, when people believe it's time for a change, right? And I, I yeah. think there's a bit of that seeping in, in in certainly in in some of the urban areas in Regina and Saskatoon. I, it, people that I talk to, you know, that are a little bit tired of uh, the SAS party and also Scott Moe. I don't want to overstate it, but I think there's some of that. I don't see an issue out there. I mean, the, I guess it might depend on how hard he goes on this economic autonomy sort of uh, uh, issue that he's, uh, um, you know, raised. And, uh, you know, how if, if people see him as going too far, then there might be some growing pushback. But I, at this point, I don't see anything. Dwayne, you got some advice for Carla Beck, the new leader of the NDP? Well, I, I uh, 
see a huge opening and opportunity right now with the um, uh, recession that we're just starting into. The same things in other parts of uh, Canada. I mean, Shaunavon uh, East End, the areas that, that I live in, no different than anywhere else. Food prices, interest rates on your house, cost of rent. Um, all of those things and the fact that the government's been there 15 years, time for a change. I just think there's a wonderful campaign. Uh, if she speaks to the issue of Scott Moe's character, is he fit to be premier? Um, question number one. Number two, the waste and scandals, the, the amount of money, the Avarez still owned by an oligarch from Russia. None of those questions. So you deal with those and then offer up solutions to the recession. I think you could put together, I think if uh, Corey and I threw away our politics and the four of us got together, we could design a pretty impressive campaign for the NDP in Saskatchewan if they would just listen and follow. <laughs> Yeah, my, my suspicion is Corey would know just how to do that. Yeah, um, Corey, what do you, what do you think? Uh, I mean, you're you know, I, I I know that you've been part of building the Saskatchewan Party apparatus. I presume you didn't think it would win in perpetuity forever. So, um, what do you think? Are what do you think going forward is well, likely to be uh, the dynamic of Saskatchewan politics? Well, I, I think the things that are are you know likely to cause a government to change like from this situation are the same thing that we've seen in other political dynasties. It's, it's if you start uh, becoming overly entitled, it's if you start offering bad government and I think, you know, corruption and scandal and things like that. I think, I think the Saskatchewan government uh, party has run a, a pretty clean government, but you know, it, you got to really pay attention to that stuff because uh, ultimately uh, you know, if, if people feel like you're there for, 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 for your, your own betterment as opposed to uh, theirs, as opposed to, uh, you know, managing the, pro uh, the, the province in a, in a, a sound way, uh, and you're not able to, you know, deliver eff effectively on that, uh, that's what sets the table for a charismatic leader to come in uh, in another party. And I, I would say, you know, if, if that were to happen, it's as likely to be a new party that we haven't conceived yet than it is to be the NDP. Because I, I, I think the, the weight of problems around brand that, uh, that they have uh, at the federal level are huge. And uh, in the same way that for to have success occur, the Saskatchewan party had to, to, to birth itself out of the Liberal and, and, the, and the old PC party, to get away from the brand problems associated with, you know, having a, a, a substantial, probably the largest number of people ever for, <laughs> uh, for, who were elected uh, getting charged with a crime, uh, you know, to get out from under the weight of that negative brand, there, there had to be a new party form. And so, like, I, 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 I would say that that's probably one of the precursors that would need to happen on the opposition side or one of the things that would speed that process along. I got to think that's the way of the future. Like in the provinces, nobody wants to be carrying federal brands around yeah. anymore. They're very, very unhelpful. I mean, I'd be surprised if the Quebec liberals don't change their name. The BC liberals are changing their name. And if Rachel Notley doesn't win, Dwayne, it's because she's NDP. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right? Right. Yeah. If she was leading, if she was leading something, if she was leading the Alberta party, but that's what it was called. This yeah. wouldn't be close probably. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Brand, well, branding well. is a big issue, and, and I agree totally, Corey, it's a big problem. The question is, can you, uh, can you um, put together a campaign that goes over top? But if your brand doesn't working, it makes it that much more difficult. There's no doubt about it. Feels yeah. like it's the NDP brand has been written out of rural Saskatchewan. Well, you know, I think urban, yeah. Yeah, I think urban Saskatchewan too. It has a lot of the same problems, you know, as as you were talking about. You know, the you're the Husky upgrader or the co-op upgrader. Or, you know, you're yeah, you're working in any of those working class jobs. You know, uh, uh, having uh, uh, Jugmeet Singh roll through town on his e bike isn't really going to help your campaign at all. Well, I knew Saskatchewan had changed when the when the when the co-op locked their workers out to take their pension benefits away. 
that, that, yeah. that, that, you would have to spend an hour on that one, David. Yeah. <laughs> Gentlemen, this has been an absolutely delightful conversation. Thanks so much, Dale. Thanks for writing this book and starting off this conversation. It's a great contribution to political science in this country. Oh, uh, left to right. Everyone. There it is. <laughs> absolutely. Thanks. Um, and, yeah. uh, you know, obviously a more successful version of your previous book, Rumors of Glory, the Ross Thatcher <laughs> years, yeah, yeah. feels yeah. to me like maybe Brad Wall was a more talented politician than Ross Thatcher. Um, yeah. so, <laughs> I think you're so, right. Thank you all very much. Corey, thanks for coming on and sharing your wisdom about this. Dwayne, take you away from the farm. I know how much you hate that. Thanks for doing it. <laughs> Love uh, it. I couldn't thanks. have had a better panel on this. So, you guys, I'd like to thank our presenting sponsor, TELUS, and our sponsor, CN Rail, and the MasterCard Foundation, everybody who watched or listened to the show. Corey, Dale, Dwayne, thanks for joining us. See you next week with more Hurley Burley. Hurley Burley, Hurley.